Uh, it is a big question, and um, I'll answer it um, in the round first of all. And part of the proposals that we've put forward for expansion include a new approach to managing environmental impacts called green controlled growth. And the idea behind this approach is that we set certain limits um, and we make commitments that the airport will operate within those limits. Um, so that relates to noise, to air quality, to carbon and to road transport. So that overarching framework will make sure as the airport grows, those particular impacts, whether it is noise or carbon, don't exceed the limits set out in that green controlled growth strategy. That's the first time that approach has been um, developed for a UK airport. It's absolutely groundbreaking and gives some reassurance and commitment that the growth of the airport, which brings with it benefits around jobs, economic benefits, uh, will operate within defined environmental parameters. Um, the green controlled growth approach will be independently managed and uh, operated. It'll be subject to regular monitoring and enforcement. Um, and the details are set out in, in, in full in the consultation. So I'd encourage people to, to, to look at that and, and to, um, to, to read it and make any comments they have. Um, but that gives some reassurance that the growth of the airport will take place within those environmental uh, limits and won't exceed that. Now, clearly, as an airport owner and operator, there are limitations on what you can do in terms of controlling emissions of the aircraft in the sky. The government has set out a clear strategy on this that's evolving very quickly. In fact, it was updated last week, the Jet Zero strategy that talks about sustainable aviation fuels, talks about hydrogen, talks about electric flight, all those things. So that process is evolving quite quickly. So where we stand at the moment, we you know, make the assumption that the um, government will meet their legal obligations they've signed up to by 2050. Um, and the Jet Zero strategy is setting out in growing detail how they propose to do that through aircraft in the sky. Now, the other two forms of carbon that you've touched on, the um, airport operations and ground transport, are areas that we can influence directly or indirectly, which is why they featured very prominently in the plans for expansion and commitments have been made around uh, reaching um, carbon neutrality for airport operations by 2030, net zero by 2040, and carbon neutrality for surface access by 2040. So that's baked into our strategy and the green controlled growth kind of mechanism is the kind of checks and balances kind of to make sure that we uh, deliver within those commitments. So we did challenge ourselves to see how far we could go in terms of um, res taking responsibility. Um, and I think where we've definitely said is we're looking for eco-partnerships with our stakeholders, and that's part of the system's thinking, to say that it's how we all integrate and work together by using all the different levers and recognising the government has levers that we don't have. That's how Luton will be the best place to travel. In fact, I go further and say, you know, ultimately, when you're looking at, and comparing airports, people perhaps ought to go and travel via Luton, because when you look at the impact uh, when you look at the impact of the, um, uh, the, the, the results to date, even, and the, and the results going forward in the future, you'll find that proportionately the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions equivalents that come out of Luton are less pro rata per passenger, perhaps, than in other places. And that's an interesting debate for the future. Yeah, we're, we're hugely proud as a as a community airport, the money that goes back into communities. I mean, the whole purpose of the operations and the investment in the airport is to deliver improvements to Luton and to support um, local organisations and charities. And there's over 50 that are substantially supported. Um, you talk in cash terms, that's over £155 million you know, for the... Uh, uh, of investment projects that, that have improved the lives of tens of thousands of people. And we kept that going during COVID. You know, there were 75,000 people a year, I think, during the COVID peak that were, were benefiting from this. So you've got Active Luton. Um, we've got, you know, the, the Alzheimer's Society. You don't need me to list them all, but they're, they're, we are substantial there because they're the first line of support and the first beneficiaries of, uh, of, of the actions and activities. We also have discretionary services, of course, 
but supported through our payments back to the council who who invest with us. Um, so that's 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 hugely important in terms of cultural festivals that sit in there. I, mean, I constantly have to remind myself, but you know we do have the the Luton Carnival, the the, the Mila, the fireworks, all these cultural events because we recognise that it isn't enough just to um, uh, to be contributing money, it's supporting these organisations that glue the fabric of our society together and give everyone the best possible opportunity. And of course, it also goes into jobs, job training, development, skills, etc. that are very much part of the, uh, the Luton message in trying to ensure that we, um, we, we help the local people to get the best possible jobs they can. And, uh, and of course, it's a real living wage airport as well. So um, that's that's the reason that a lot of us get together and work on these projects, it's because it does something different than any other airport in the country.